Uh, does high intensity interval training affect bone mass or bone density? Do you know? This is where, you know, it goes like f to this point, I, you know, I've encouraged us to think about mode specific when we're making some of these comparisons. I think that's where it depends, right? And so we know that more higher impact um, events or, or activities, certainly when we're young, tend to, you know, lay down more, more bone. Uh, and so, you know, if we're talking high intensity cycling, versus high intensity running, those things are very different, right? Are you running on concrete? Are you running outside in beautiful trails? Uh, all of those things matter. You know, the, the flip side to that is if we talk about injury risk, people say, well, I can't do high intensity training. I'm gonna increase my risk for injury. Well, I, you know, I'm someone with classic left knee osteoarthritis. I just tore meniscus in my right knee playing hockey. So I'm gonna have osteoarthritis in that knee soon. I can engage in very vigorous interval training on the bike. I can't and I don't run anymore. So, you know, hit training on the bike, no problem. Any sort of running outside is excruciating for me. So joint problems in general, um, people people can, do you think people can engage in in, in cycling? I, I, I do, yes. And, 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 you know, we know certainly, uh, and again, like I'm not an expert in this area, but, you know, talking to experts and, and just trying to read and stay abreast of the literature, you know, we know the people who have joint injuries, certainly meniscal injuries or osteoarthritis, one of the best things that you can do is remain active. And it's obviously frustrating advice for many people because they're like, I want to be active, but it hurts when I'm active. And so moving towards less weight bearing activities that allow you to be active around the joint and maybe, you know, help with the, the, the tissues around the joint, but aren't impactful forces. So cycling is a fantastic exercise for individuals with osteoarthritis because you can still engage in fairly vigorous activity without hurting or, or damaging you know specifically your knees in this case yeah that's great I know there's 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 quite a few people that uh, are under the misconception that they cannot do any type of high intensity interval training because they have joint issues so um, yeah they don't want to do box jumps right but <laughs> yeah I mean jumping rope which may actually be good great for the bones I mean yeah. it's impactful and um, you can do certainly do high intensity intervals with a uh, jumping rope as well um, what about so there's we talk about like some of this you know uh, we're talking about some of these like misconceptions I guess. And you kind of touched on this a little bit when we were talking about maybe, you know, people that are, uh, shouldn't engage in high intensity interval training, like the people with, uh, AFib or, um, angina, pec what was yep, it? Yep. <laughs> that, um, heart problem. Um, the, 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 the fact that doing high intensity interval training could cause AFib or coronary calcification or just even like elite athletes in general like you if, at the high level you can see they have a higher tendency for afib and coronary calcification but on the same in the same breath they also have a lower risk of uh, you know ca cardiovascular related mortality um is there a way to rec reconcile those things so again uh not expert but my read of this including you know there's some really there's some really good reviews that have come out recently and again we could drop those in the show notes to direct people to reading on this but the you know the old latin phrase the the, the poison is in the dose right there there's definitely evidence that individuals who over a lifetime engage in very high intensity, very high volume exercise may uh, be at greater risk for some of these uh, issues that you just referred to, heart, heart issues. Um, the, to my read and my understanding, while there's theories out there, the, a definitive cause and effect or mechanistic basis hasn't been definitively established. And the other is it's been pointed out that those date like while clearly that risk is there and you see examples of this it doesn't fit or doesn't line up with the longevity data which is still that you know lifetime runners will still have you know a few more years of life compared to others so i think it's a it's an issue that still really needs to be resolved and probably the safest advice would be, you know, extreme exercise may carry some, some consequences, right? Whether it's the U shape or the, the J shape curve, there is something to that. And if you're on, you know, this is 
for the vast majority of people, this isn't an issue. But you know, if you are that extreme uh, exerciser, you, you just need to be mindful of the fact that that may carry some increased cardiovascular uh, risk. Yeah. Um, so I one more oddball question before my my last one, which is. Um, have you, what, what are your thoughts on this, like, hypoxic training? Like, have you heard of, like, the mouth taping during, like, a hit or? So my, my sense would, I, yes, yes, I've definitely heard of it. Uh, you know, clearly when you move to uh, more intensive exercise, the vast majority of your ventilation is through your mouth. So it's, it's really hard to engage in vigorous exercise. Uh, when you're restricting either nasal breathing or mouth breathing, you're, you're going to compromise your performance. It may feel really hard, you know, uh, because you're inducing this added stress, whether it's beneficial, I, I, I'm not convinced, uh, of that. I, you know, I think the data around blood flow restricted training is much more, uh, interesting. And there's some really, uh, really interesting work coming, uh, out of, out of that, you know, you can, make the case that maybe you're going to see some changes in respiratory or diaphragm muscle or that, but getting back to the idea of what limits VO2 max, it's generally not a pulmonary limitation. It's a heart limitation. And so strategies that are really trying to additionally stress the pulmonary system. So, I, you know, if, if people want to try it, fine. I, I don't think there's tremendous evidence that that's going to, um, potentiate training uh, responses. What's the uh, interesting thing about blood flow restriction? Is it? Well, just, you know, like I, I think definitely, you know, as, as a therapist, so I, I, um, I'm aware of some ongoing work, I guess that's about, and you know, this isn't our work, but I'm a, aware of some work looking at blood flow restriction exercise and training in very, very high level uh, endurance athletes uh, showing some interesting uh, changes in performance related metrics or, or, or some measures. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, like I say, that work is ongoing. Um, th the hard thing with these is it's, you can't truly blind someone to blood flow restricted training, right? Like many of these interventions that we've talked about, it's tough to have a true control who's completely blinded to the intervention that can influence some, some things. But you know, the, the, the idea of blood flow restricted training, allowing individuals getting back to joint issues, maybe working at a lower absolute force or workload, but still seeing the metabolic stresses induced with blood flow restricted training. I, you know, there's some, there's some interesting work there, I think.